Hello everyone, welcome to lab today. Today it's about weather. Uh, last week we looked at climate and how the average weather characteristics over uh, time gives us an overall look at the climate. Uh, we're gonna focus in on weather today. And of course, weather is invisible. We can't really see it other than maybe the clouds in the atmosphere. Uh, and so there are uh, special devices we use to measure the different weather conditions like temperature, humidity, pressure, um, and a good way to visualize that and help us to predict weather in the future is to actually map those things out. And so creating a surface weather map helps us to understand better how our weather patterns are behaving and how we think they might behave in the future. And so today it's all about uh, predicting weather and looking at the devices we use to measure it and how we actually go about constructing a, a surface weather map so we can better uh, tell what the weather's gonna be like later today, tomorrow, and uh, throughout the week. So here we go, let's talk about weather. All right, we begin our journey through this lab by looking at uh, the background here, noting that um, weather stations throughout the world transmit weather data to the World Meteorological Centers um, located in Melbourne, Australia, Moscow, Russia, and Washington, D.C. And then that weather data is disseminated to the different um, weather centers for interpretation. Um, it's of note that uh, they use a universal uh, system for time, the Greenwich Mean Time or Universal coordinate time, co Coordinated Time. Meteorologists often refer to this as Zulu time or Z time. Thus, uh, uh, at any given location, weather is indicated in Z. 1200 Z would be um, noon, uh, as an example. And it the weather data is also given in a set of symbols, universal symbols. And the universal symbols are actually shown uh, what they mean on the next page here, going through and des describing sky cover and wind and uh, what the fronts look like here, uh, and then the what different weather symbols used. Uh, but in general, these weather station models are shown in this notation. You can see here, in the center is the location, and a little wind barb shows the wind speed and direction, so you know what the wind is like. You also know what the cloud cover is like. If it's the circle is completely colored, colored in, that means it's uh, cl uh, overcast and cloudy. It even tells you the types of clouds right above here in the center and just below uh, the weather station model there, in, circled in blue. Additionally, you get temperature given, and temperature is usually given in the upper left here. Uh, dew point temperature is given in the lower left, shown here in orange. The pressure of the area is given in the upper right, and that is right here. And the precipitation amounts in the lower right, which is given right here. Uh, information about pressure is actually given um, below the pressure area here. And uh, information about the precipitation, a little bit more information about the precipitation is given here. Additionally, they actually outline what type of weather is in the area, and that's given by uh, the symbols that you see um, just to the left of the symbol. So um, this is all listed here, so you can kind of refer back to this and see what's what but I kind of want to give you an overview of what the stations look like. And again, this page, the next page shows uh, kind of an interpretation of the symbols, noting, for example, the different types of sky cover and what each of those symbols mean. The wind barbs um, uh, are one to two miles an hour if they're alone. If they put a little um, barb on there, it is five miles an hour. A longer barb is 10 miles an hour. And any combination of those gives you different wind speeds. If it's going 50 miles an hour, they put a flag there. And so you can, of course, put those together to find, find the different kinds of wind. So the first part of this lab for me is to have you uh, just kind of get familiar with these station models because these tell us what the weather are, is at certain locations and it helps us to analyze the weather. So the first question then is going to have you going through and looking at the different uh, scenarios, three, four different scenarios of what weather station model is telling us. All right, and I'm gonna go walk, walk you through this most complicated one and have you do the other three on your own. Okay, so uh, looking at this one, comparing our station model, we note that, of course, again, temperature is given in the upper left corner. 
So we can start there with temperature. And the temperature then is 27 degrees. So you can go ahead and write that one in there, 27 degrees. And uh, the bare, um, so that's temperature here in the upper right corner, or sorry, upper left corner. In the upper right corner is the pressure. And barometric pressure is a funny one. For some reason, um, well, well, for reasons of not putting the entire um, pressure measurement in there, what they do is they give you th usually three numbers. And what you do is you put a decimal point between the last two uh, numbers, and you add a 9 or a 10 uh, in this location here. You add a 9 if, it is, if the number here is 50 or more, you add a 9. So in this case, we would add a 9. So the pressure here is 999.7 millibars. And the, the, the measurement isn't given in millibars. That's how um, meteorologists measure temperature. So you have to put a decimal behind and add a 9 if it's 50 or greater, or a 10 if it's less than 50. And so that's our pressure there. So our barometric pressure is 999.7 millibars. Okay. Um, just to kind of put a point on it, if we come over here and look at this one, uh, we're going to put our decimal point between the last two numbers, and this is below 50, so we're going to put a 10 in front. So our pressure is 1,011.7 millibars here. All right. Next is the dew point temperature, and the dew point temperature, the temperature at which uh, the temperature needs to drop for dew to start forming for the for the uh, humidity to be 100%. So that gives us an idea of how much water vapor is in the air. The dew point temperature here is 25 degrees. <clears throat> the sky coverage here, the sky cover it right here, if we go back to our uh, paper that shows us the sky cover, you can see that uh, this would be overcast. So we would put overcast or um, you could put 100%. We're gonna go ahead and put overcast. The current weather right now shows two dots. Remember the weather is shown off to the left here and two dots indicate that um, it's rain. And if you go to the lower part here in the weather characteristics, uh, one dot means rain. Two dots means light rain. Three dots means moderate rain. Four dots means heavy rain. And of course there's other symbols. This here you're gonna see the thunderstorm symbol in another one of these that you're working on today. But those three dot, those two dots indicate that it's light rain. So we're gonna go ahead and write light rain for the uh, current weather. And the wind speed. Note that the wind barbs here uh, are three long ones. So each one is 10, so 10, 20, 30 knots. And it's given in knots, whoops. 30 there, 30 knots. And then we have the wind direction. And the wind direction is shown by the barb. The barb is actually pointing the direction the wind is flowing. So the wind uh, direction is usually given from where the wind is coming from. And so if north is here and south is here, west is here and east is here, then the wind is coming from about the northwest. If you put north, northwest, you'd also be correct. So we put from the, the wind direction from where it's coming from. Where coming from. Um, there's also extra information about pressure, as I said over here on this uh, location. And um, the pressure tendency, when you have a backslash, it means it's falling. And when a forward, when given a forward slash, it means rising. Uh, and so in this case, the pressure is falling. And the pressure change during the last three hours would be uh, this, uh, this um, term here. And it's given in tenths. So it doesn't put a point there, but it actually gives uh, it in tenths. So you would actually put a point in front of that. So point one one for the pressure change. And you would say uh, falling. Okay. And then we also have the pressure tendency. Oh, the pressure tendency we put falling down here. Sorry. 
So, and that it's a backslash. A forward slash would mean rising. So, use this information that we just went through to complete the other three uh, for this part. The next section of our lab is dealing with ISO lines, and ISO lines are used to uh, show visually what's going on on a broader scale with the weather station uh, readouts either temperature, dew point, pressure, wind. ISO lines can be used to give us a visual of what's going on. And um, if, for example, you're using ISO lines for temperature, they're called isotherms. If you're using ISO lines for pressure, they're called isobars. Uh, dew point are called isodrosotherms. Um, and so we're gonna work with these today, starting with uh, temperature. And you can kind of see how these ISO lines here for this particular, these are isodrosotherms as in our example. Uh, what they do is they separate uh, temper temperatures or dew points or pressures of equal amounts. And so it creates zones. Um, and the lines are usually smooth and they're usually estimates. Uh, and so we're gonna go through and kind of talk about these for temperature. So let's start with temperature here or isotherms, and you're asked to uh, create a 70 degree Fahrenheit isotherm and a 75 degree isotherm. Now an 80 degree isotherm is already in here, and what you do to create an isotherm is you just draw a line between similar temperatures. If we're drawing an 80 degree isotherm, we're going to put an X where we think 80 is, and it's of course right here, and so then we would draw in our 80 degree isotherm here and draw on the line connecting points of equal temperature. The 75 degree ISO line, or excuse me, the 70 degree ISO line, we'll start there, um, would be uh, where every, everywhere you see 70 degrees, and remember temperature is in the upper left of the um, weather station um, symbol. So we're going to put X's where we see 70 degrees and it's in the center of the circle, that's where we're at. We're just gonna connect those with the line now. And bada bing, bada boom, you have just drawn in a 70 degree isotherm, okay? Lastly, we're asked to draw in a 75 degree isotherm. And of course, everywhere there's 75, you're going to put an X. So we're putting X's here and here for these 75. But you look and see, this is 78 degrees. So what do you do when uh, a temperature is not given um, of the same amount? This is 78 degrees and 70 degrees is here. 75 is gonna be somewhere in between these two. And so I'm gonna to go to the place where 75 would be. If this is 70 and I'm counting up 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 75 would show up right about here between these two. I can estimate that 75 would be here. With this temperature is 78, not 75, 75 would be here. 74, 73, 72, 71, and 70, okay? And again, then I'm gonna draw in my lines connecting points of equal temperature to one another, just connecting the X's. And so I draw my line from here to here and then further interpret it that way. And there's my 75 degree isotherm. So you can see how uh, isotherms or any iso lines are drawn by connecting points of equal value. All right, and what this does is it shows us zones. Um, you can say, say then between these zones, it's 75 and 80 degrees. Between these zones, it's between 70 and 75. And then you'll, you'll see on um, weather maps, of course, that these zones are colored in. And so you see, oh, I'm in the red zone, I must be 90 degrees or more, or I'm in the orange zone, I must be 70, um, uh, 80 to 70 degrees there, et cetera. And so that's what these are useful for. We're gonna go on and draw some ISO lines on a actual weather map. Now the description up here goes through and talks about what I just talked about, how to put an X in between uh, to estimate where temperatures are. And I'm asking you in this particular activity to draw in 45 degree, 55 degree, and 65 degree isotherms. So let's do that. Um, I'll put the 45 degree in red because it's uh, cold and 55 degree, um, I'm sorry, I'll put it in blue. Uh, for 45 degrees, the orange for 55 degrees, and the 65 degree red for warmer. Okay, so we started with the 45 degree isotherm. What I'm gonna do is look at this map and see where it's 45 degrees. And of course, here's a 45 degree right here. 
You can see by the temperature in the upper left there. So here is one place where I'm going to have my line go through. Um, here's another place that says 46 and another place that says 39. So uh, I'm going to kind of start in this corner and move around. You'll see that because this is 46 and this is 39, 45 is probably going to be somewhere close to the 46 mark and away from the 39 mark. I'm going to put 45. I would put an X right about here, okay, to indicate that that's where it is in between the two. And um, similarly, between 46 and 38, 45 is probably very close to the 46. So if I'm going to connect those two lines, I just go ahead and do that. I, if I want to continue my line this way, where do I go? Well, uh, 46 is here and 39 is here. Again, 45 between these two is going to be right about here. So I'm going to connect those two lines with that X. And then I want to continue to draw my line through. So I just go to weather station readings here. Between these two, 39 and 52, uh, 45 is going to kind of be directly between them-ish. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put an X right here. And of course, here's a 45 right here, so the X would be right in the center. So I can go ahead and kind of continue my line through. Uh, between these two, 42, 40, 45, uh, let's see here. Continuing on, 61 is here, okay? And 42 is here between 42 and 61. Where is 45? Probably right about here. So I'm going to go ahead, my line's curving in a different way. Between 42 and uh, 61 then, uh, 61 and 44 here, where's 45? Probably close to the 44, so I'm going to continue my line here. Between 66 and 46 here, maybe right about here. Let's see here, 66, 46, so 45 is going to be right about here. In fact, 45 is actually right here, so I'll put another little line here. And I guess I can probably just go ahead and take my line this way. So it takes an interesting turn. You just have to kind of curve your lines as estimates. So my 45 degree goes off the map over here. Where does it go on this side? I'm going to come over here. This is 45. We got a 52 and a 39. So 45 is probably directly right between there. So I'm going to curve my line down to that point. Between 39 and 57, 45 is probably somewhere right here. So I'm going to continue my line this way. I can continue to use this 39 point. Here's a 54 over here. 45 is probably going to be right about in between, maybe a little closer to the 39. So I'm going to come over here with that. Noting that 43 and 46 are here. So 45 is probably going to be right about here. So I'm going to come right over here with it. And there's a 45 down here. So um, I'm going to bring my line down to there and I can exit there. So here's the rest of the 45 degree isotherm. Now your job is going to be to draw on the 55 and 65. All right, I'll help, help you get started with those. 55, we kind of find on the map that all the areas right here are actually colder than 45 degrees. So my 55 degree isotherm is going to be um, somewhere in this area here. We can kind of start in the middle again, like we, we, talk, we talked earlier. 52 and 57 gives 55 right about between them right here. Same 52 and 57, 55 is going to be right about there. Between 52 and 61, 55 is going to be closer to the 52 over here. 61 and 45 would put 55 right about here. So you can see my line starting to form. Okay. Between 61 and 61, nope. We know that 61 is here and 42 is here. Where would be 55? It would be right about here. So my line's coming down here. 44 and 66 would put 55 right about directly in the center. So I'm coming on there. Same, 46 and 63, we'd have 55 right about here. And it looks like it probably trails off that way. We, it might actually curve this way because the 45 curved that way, so we might curve it that way as well. But this is the 55 degree isotherm and where it comes off the map there. Again, then I'm going between these 57 and 36 is going to have 55 close to here. And then we have 57 and 54 here, so 55 is going to be closer to right about here. 
So we're coming this way with it. 54 and 66 would have 55 right next to the 54. So we're coming here. 54 and 66, 55 would be there. And 45 and 66 would have 55 right about in the middle. So the 55 degree isotherm comes off the map here. Okay. Can you draw on the 65? Hopefully you can. Or I'm going to leave you to 65 and I'm going to leave you to answer the questions on the bottom. All right. All right, the next section here deals with air masses. And of course, the warm air and cold air that we mapped out with isotherms in the last, pay, or the last section um, is coming from somewhere. And the air above a, a particular region takes on the characteristics of that region. If the air is above water, it's gonna be more moist. If the air is above land, dry. Likewise, if the air is in a colder area, developing over a colder area, it's going to be cold and if it's developing over a warm area, it's going to be warm. And so we have particular denotations for the different types of air uh, pockets we call air masses. And here they are. Maritime equatorial would be, uh, and, and they're given with the uh, moisture level here uh, in the first as a lowercase level, so or, or lowercase letter, so moisture is given there. And then temperature is a uppercase as the second letter. So this would be temperature, okay? So this is a uh, maritime environment. So this would be a moist air mass. And equatorial means near the equator, that's gonna be a really, really hot air mass, okay? Likewise, these maritimes are moist air masses. Tropical would be warm and polar would be cold. And likewise, continental, tropical, continental is going to be dry. So each of these is dry air masses with tropical warm, polar being cold, and Arctic being very cold, okay? And what I'm asking you to do is to put the symbol for each of these air masses in the map given here below, okay? So um, first of all, we can note is that Arctic air masses are cold and uh, are very cold, and polar air masses are semi-cold. So uh, the ones coming from this region are going to be polar, whereas this is Arctic. Okay. Likewise, then, the um, moisture level over this region, uh, now this region is tricky. This is um, going to be continental because it's uh, mostly ice up there, um, ice pack. Uh, so that's why I'm doing that one for you. And then this one here, this is, of course, over the continent of Canada, so it's also a continental. So the symbols here are going to be CA and CP. Okay. Likewise, this one is over um, probably some water, um, not yet to that ice pack uh, just south of Greenland there. So we're going to call that maritime. And of course, it's coming from cold, so it's polar. Okay. From this information, you should be able to tell what this one's going to be. So I'll leave that one to you. Okay. Likewise, in the south here, uh, we have uh, regions of warmer temperatures, of course. So, for example, um, the air masses down here are going to be tropical. We don't, we're not far enough to the, toward the equator to get equatorial. So this is also going to be considered tropical here uh, because it, the Gulf Stream is warm water coming up from the, the south. So those are tropical air masses. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, we have a continental variety here, and that's forming over the, the, the Mexico um, uh, land mass, uh, whereas this one is forming over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, now, very interestingly enough, this Mexican um, dry, warm air mass actually intrudes in and usually hangs out um, in the south by Texas and Oklahoma, and it forms what we call a dry line. And when you hear the word dry line, you're, you're, it's a forcing mechanism for tornado uh, formation. So we'll talk about that maybe uh, later on in uh, this class. Uh, <clears throat> and the maritime tropical air mass over the Gulf of Mexico is usually responsible for most of the, the moisture, warm, moist air that comes up and causes clouds and storms uh, because this sits over the top and this continental polar air mass from, from uh, Canada gets funneled down through the central part of the U.S. by the Rocky Mountains. And so this comes plowing up. It's more dense, so it plows up that warm, moist air and causes clouds and storms all through the central part of the U.S. So much so that the central part of the U.S. is called Tornado Alley. Seventy percent of all tornadoes in the world occur right here 
because of this perfect storm of warm, moist air, for, which is the fuel, and cold, um, dry air, which is the plowing mechanism or the, the lifting mechanism. Okay, we have a maritime topical air mass over here. I'm gonna leave these two air masses to you. But air masses are important because uh, they are ultimately what cause, the clashing of them is are ultimately what causes, which is what causes our weather here in the central part of the U.S. Fronts are the boundary between two air masses. So the air masses we discussed in the last page, uh, for example, this one, um, this scenario here, you have kind of a cold, dry air mass. So that would be continental polar air mass up here. And your warm tropical air mass down here would be uh, maritime tropical, okay, from down here. And the, you can see the wind barbs blowing in the air this way. Uh, like we talked about from Canada, versus the tropical air mass wafting up from the Gulf of Mexico here. The boundary between two, these two air masses is called fronts. And fronts typically occur between, and you can tell where there's a front because there's a sharp temperature gradient. Uh, you'll find a very sharp temperature gradient here. Uh, you'll have a uh, sharp moisture gradient, uh, noting that, for example, this is like, for example, it's 46 degrees with a moisture of about 56 degrees, 45, 33, 49, 37. These are low temperatures and, and low moistures. You compare that, and, and these as well, you compare that with, say, this one uh, was the 61 degrees and a 57 degree uh, dew point, meaning it's a little bit more moist. Comparing that to the 49, 41, they're different, significantly different. And so, Sharp gradients uh, in temperature and moisture, and even changes in wind direction, noting that these winds are blowing this way and these winds are blowing this way, you have a front, okay? Uh, and so the front, the boundary between the two air masses, is indicated by certain symbols. For example, you're asked to draw in a front here to show the contrast between this air mass, which is coming this way, and this one, which is blowing up this way. And so you're in asked to draw a line here. And I know that this is a cold front because the air behind it is colder and drier. And cold fronts are shown by a line with, a blue line with blue triangles. So you'll note that the wind barbs are blowing this way, and so too are the triangles pointing this way, showing that the cold front is moving in that direction. Likewise, we have the warm front, and I already drew it in. Uh, my video got interrupted by a phone call, so I had already drawn it in here. But I wanted to show you that this warm air mass is wafting this way, and the front of that warm air is right here. And so we draw in a line here, and the warm front is given by the half circles in red, as you can see pictured here. And typically, the warm front meets the cold front, and where that happens, air actually starts to swirl upward. And so we'll deal with that idea. It's called low pressure. We'll deal with that idea in the next section. So in this section, we're going to focus on pressure. And pressure um, is measured and given because the pressure of the air helps us determine whether the air is descending or rising. If the, air, if the pressure is lower, that means the air is rising, and where you have rising air, you have clouds and storms. Uh, so this is useful information. Where you have air descending or coming down, you're going to have higher pressure, and you're going to have clear weather. Because rising air equals clouds and storms. So in this section, then, we want to draw in some ISO lines so we know where the pressure is lowest and where it's the highest. And remember, our ISO lines are drawn in between areas of pressure at a, usually about 1,000 millibars, 1,004 millibars, 1,008 millibars, 1,012 millibars, and this is um, at every four millibars, uh, four millibars um, as we go through. And um, typically the lowest pressure area on the map is given a, a big red L, and so we're gonna do that today with this. Now remember, when pressure is given, it's given with just three numbers, and you have to do some doctoring on those numbers to get them to where you need them to be. So, for example, if we start in the upper uh, left here of our page, remember a decimal point goes in between the last two numbers, 
and a 10 or a 9 is added to the front. A 10 if the number is less than 50, and a 9 if the number is more than 50. Okay, so I went in and written in all the pressures so that we can kind of better interpret them. It's usually better to kind of have that available rather than trying to interpret them in your head. It makes things more clear. And we're, in, we're supposed to draw in ISO lines of 1004, 1008, and 1012. So we'll start with 1004. And with 1004, uh, we're going to find areas uh, that are between um, 1004 and below. So in this case, for example, we can kind of look around the map and see where we have lower pressures. And I can, I can see that there's 1004.4 here and 1002.9 here. So right in between these is going to be 1004. In fact, I would probably put a little X right there to indicate where the 1004 would be, the 1004.0. Likewise, between 1002 and 1009, 1004 is going to be somewhere like right around here. And between 1002.9 and 1012.4, it's going to be closer to here. And we keep going. We 1002 and 1013, we would have 1004 right there. 1002 and 1008, 1004 would be right about here. And then we have 1002 and 1002, so we're going to hop to this one. Between 1002 and um, 1008, 1004 would be somewhere right around here. 1002 and 1009, we'd have 1004 right there. This is 1002 and 1002, so that's not going to work. We're going to jump to this one real quick and see between 1002 and 1009, 1004 would be right about there. 1002 and 1008, 1004 is here. 1002, 1006, 1004 right between them. And 1,002 and 1,004, 1,004 is going to be closer. So here we got, we've got a little uh, area here where we're going to just connect our X's. Um, we didn't go off the map this time. We actually went in a circle if we're going to connect all those. So in this area right here is below 1,004. And then this is the 1,004 line, okay, for pressure. So below this is, a th is less than, and above this is above. So uh, we're asked to draw in a big L to represent the lowest pressure. And right where then Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri meet is where I might draw a big red L to indicate that there's a low, the lowest pressure on the map is right here. And if indeed, we can kind of look around and see that. Okay. Uh, the next level up then is our 1,008 millibar line. And when we're looking at that, uh, we started here in the middle, so 1,004, so 1,008 is going to be somewhere out from that. In fact, here's 1,008.8, .8, so just above 1,008, so I'll put an X right next to that. We have 1,010 and 1,006 here, so 1,008 is going to go right in between those. So I'm going to come this way. Uh, going back the other way for a sec, uh, 1,002 and 1,009, 1,008 is going to be closer to 1,009, so I'm going to come this way. So you can kind of see it's probably going to be a circle likewise to the other. Between 1,009 and 1,000, this one's 1,008.4, so we're coming right here uh, close to this one. And between 1,015 and 1,008.4, we come right here. 1,008 and 1,013 is right here. 1,012 and 1,008. This one is 1,008.4 and 1,009, so right in, it's going to be kind of closer this way. Uh, let's see here, 1,002 and 1,012, 1,008 would be right in here. 1,004 and 1,009, 1,008 is going to be closer to here. So you kind of see this take shape, kind of winds around this one here, comes this way. We keep going. Uh, between 1,004.4 and 1,009, 1,008 is going to be closer to this, so we're going to kind of come this way with it. Uh, let's see here, between 1,004 and 1,014, 1,008 is going to be somewhere here. This one is 1,007.5, and this one's 1,011, so 1,008 is going to be somewhere here, so we're going to kind of come around like this. Between 1,012 and 1,007, 1,008. 
thousand seven thousand ten thousand eight be right about here and so we can kind of just kind of connect our lines and there we have it that's our thousand one thousand eight millibar line okay so we can actually see our zones here a thousand be, below a thousand four would be like right in this zone here right and this area between 1004 and 1008 is where we're going to have everything in between. So this is kind of its own little zone, right? And um, they don't usually color these in on maps. They usually just leave the lines. But uh, the, the pressure then is, is telling us that this pressure is low on the surface. And the pressure outside of it is higher. And when you look at the isolines, the air is kind of flowing into that low pressure and it's coming up and swirling in. And so air swirls into low pressure like a toilet bowl and it actually flushes upward. Okay, so the air actually hits together at the surface and because it's rushing in and the pressure here is low, if you were standing here, there will be less air molecules on you, around you. That's because the air is swirling upward because of the, it's swirling because of the Coriolis effect and it's moving upward. So it's like a toilet flushing upward of air molecules. So the air molecules are rushing in and rushing up. Remember what I said happens when air rises? Rising air equals clouds and storms. The air rises, cools, condenses, and forms clouds, and that, of course, forms precipitation. So anywhere you see these low pressure, you're probably going to get clouds and storms on a, on a uh, pressure on a uh, weather map. And, of course, as the pressure is low, you're going to uh, con you know, continue to get that. I'm going to leave you to draw in the 1,012 millibar line and then answer these questions about uh, isobars and pressure. All right, this part is looking at wind and uh, the direction of general wind flow. And those are given by wind streamlines, which are just big arrows showing the wind direction. You can see here, this all the wind barbs are pointing uh, this way. That means the wind's coming from the northwest and going towards the southeast. And so you get a little arrow showing that. Likewise, you can see the flow of air going this way. I've asked you to add in uh, five more wind barbs, okay? Uh, so you might draw in wind barb that comes in like this. You can see the air flows this way. Uh, and then you might draw in some uh, another wind barb that comes up this way, or a wind streamline that is, excuse me. And then you can kind of see how the wind barbs are flowing. Remember that low pressure we show, showed on the last slide? These are all the same kind of weather patterns. Notice how the wind is swirling into that low pressure area. And again, as it swirls in, it swirls upward, drains upward, and that causes clouds and storms. Okay, here it is. It's go time for you. We are going to, I'm going to have you go through and interpret a surface weather map. Now you're gonna draw in all of the uh, required information here. And in the end, it's basically gonna be a combination of all the separate parts we just went through together. I'm going to ask you to draw in isobars at four millibar intervals at 1004, 1008, and 1012 on this map. Uh, remember, you're going to uh, write out the pressures, okay, for each, for example, on this, this top upper left one, you're gonna write a 10 in front of it and put a point between the last two numbers. You're going to go through and do that for all of them, and you're going to um, put in your X's for the 1004 millibar, 1008 millibar, and 1012 millibars. You're going to then put a big red L for the low pressure uh, where that occurs. You're going to draw in then, in a separate section, you're going to draw in the warm front in red and the cold front in blue. So the front of the uh, the, the very front edge of the warm air barbs, you're going to draw red, and the front edge of the, the cold air barbs, you're going to draw a blue line. You're also going to label those air masses. You can go back and look at the, the, the air mass section and the uh, weather front section for what the air masses should be labeled. Uh, I did that earlier. And then new to this map, you're going to shade in the areas receiving precipitation in green. Remember those weather map symbols? The two dots showed light rain. I even showed you the R, that means thunderstorm. Uh, so you're going to draw in maybe a little bit heavier rain in that location, a little darker green. But um, you're going to draw in and just kind of shade in the areas that are uh, raining. And bada bing, bada boom, you have created a surface weather map. 
Now remember, the purpose of drawing a surface weather map is for us to see visually on a macro scale what the weather is doing over a large region. And when we kind of compare that with past weather patterns, we can see the weather patterns and it helps us predict uh, future uh, weather systems. So try your hand at this and see how it goes. If you have any uh, questions on this, please do not hesitate to email me and ask. Well, I hope you enjoyed our lab on weather today. Nature is amazing, isn't it? How air molecules get together and they crowd together or separate themselves, and that, of course, is pressure. How fast and how uh, much energy they're distributing, that's temperature. And uh, how many water molecules are thrown into the mix, that's humidity. And together, those create our weather systems and the weather we see out there every day. Um, and um, it's all about all the molecules distributing their energy equally. Um, and it's just really neat to see how the physics of all this plays out in our atmosphere and the things we see. And of course, all this weather stuff is so that we can predict weather and see what's going on um, in the future for our weather so we can plan our weeks and our days and, and all those things that we have going on in our lives. So um, it starts with creating surface maps, measure, first of all, measuring the weather uh, conditions, then putting that onto a surface map looking at those past surface maps, recognizing those patterns, and being able to then forecast the weather. So I hope you learned a lot from this today, and we'll turn our attention to severe storms moving forward. Take care, and have a great week.